There was a preacher who was asked if all of his material was original or if he'd ever had to borrow some other people's sermon outlines and titles. He said, well, I do milk a lot of cows, but I churn my own butter. <laughs> I've looked at uh, the literature that's available on this text of Scripture. There's a lot of wonderful and intriguing sermon titles to be found. One that uh, I used to preach was called The Mad Man of the Mountain. Another is A Legion of Demons. One of the most ingenious was Taming the Tombstone Terrorist. Another, Jesus, what do you want with me? And this morning, what I wanted to look at in this text, it's so rich and full of meaning, is how this man, who had been ensnared and worse, completely enslaved to Satan, body, mind, and soul, how he had been completely set free and reborn, and though he was a man possessed, he is told as a man repossessed to go and share that good news, that incredible news with those who had known his old life and would be amazed and would marvel at his new life. And I really want to end this sermon with this line, but I think it's so important. I'm going to begin with it and try to remember to end with it when I do get to the end of the presentation. The world can willfully reject your teaching, but the world cannot reject your testimony in the sense of what God has done for you and in you and through you. It is irrefutable. If God has set you free, if Jesus Christ has washed your sins away with His blood, if He has given you new life, new meaning, new message, new mission, the world may not believe the gospel of Jesus because God has given all of us the freedom, the free moral agency to be willfully blind if we so choose. But the world cannot deny that your life has been changed for time and for eternity. When you look at this passage of Scripture, it is interesting in the larger sense. You, you ought to, from time to time, sit down and read the Gospel of Mark all the way through. It's not that long. It's the shortest of the Gospels, and it was meant to be read that way. And it tells the story of Jesus working with His hands, doing mighty works and marvelous things that showed He was the Son of the true and living God. This passage is set in the middle of four, a series of four passages about impossibilities, four impossible situations. The disciples are crossing the Sea of Galilee at night in a boat, a sailboat. They may have some oars, but they're not going to do them any good in a great storm. And if you've ever been to Galilee, you've seen how the mountains just go drop down into a bowl, and there's the sea, 13 miles long and 8 miles wide. And there is a break in the mountains, a pass to the northwest. And the wind can come down through that pass and whip up those waves and in a, a great storm at night on the Sea of Galilee in a small sailboat where you're being swamped. Waters are coming over the bow of the boat. It looks very much like an impossible situation. The second situation is this demon-possessed madman that no man could tame and no chain could hold. Then there's a third situation immediately after it about a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years and she had suffered many things at the hands of her physicians who could not heal her, who could provide her no relief. Impossible. And then finally, the daughter of Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue there on the seashore of Galilee, she was dying. No, wait a minute. The message, the sad news comes. She's now dead. There's no longer any hope. It's now impossible because people don't come back from the dead. And yet, 
Jesus is the hope of salvation. He is the hope for the hopeless. And he can take what is impossible and make it one of those things that all things are possible with God. And Mark shows Jesus here to be in quick succession, in four short but impressive, powerful stories, that Jesus is the master of the deep. If you're following along on the outline, this is something you can fill in. He's the master of the deep. He's still the storm. He is the master of the demonic. He casts out legion, the demons. He is the master of disease. He didn't even touch this woman. She touched him, and she was healed by the power of God and by her faith. And finally, he is the master of death. That wonderful story when Jesus comes to the house of Jairus, and he is about to enter to see the little girl. And there are already professional mourners out in the street wailing. They've started the funeral customary practices. And Jesus says, tells them to be quiet because... She's not dead. She's only asleep. And they laughed him to scorn, the Gospels say. And he went in and he raised that little girl from the dead and proved to be the master of the final enemy, death. The man here that we're going to look at in Mark 5, 1 is truly and fully possessed by the devil. This is a worst case scenario. We don't know how many demons were in him, but when the gospel says it doesn't even give you a number, it just says, for we are many, you know there's a lot of demonic activity going on inside this man's body. And we do know that the swine herd that ran into the sea numbered about 2,000. So a legion, a Roman legion, was not a fixed number like a battalion in the U.S. Army. It could uh, vary from 2,000 men to 6,000 men, but it was thousands. And 2,000 pigs were uh, uh, filled up with these evil spirits, possessed themselves, and they refused to tolerate it. And they died as a result of it by going down into the sea. I don't know how to explain demonic possession because it's, it's somewhat of a miraculous event. It is something that we, have, we don't encounter today. There aren't any people raising people from the dead on our earth today. Uh, but at that point in time, the supernatural was allowed to break through the natural. And there were places and there were people where the devil's power was on display, not just spiritually, not just morally, but it was on display physically. How many of you uh, have ever been fishing? Any of you ever used a cane pole with just a little cork and a bobber? Uh, have any of you ever gone offshore and fished for big fish where you have to have a gaff to get them in the boat? Sin. And evil, Satan's enticement, it could be out there on the end of a hook. And he's trying to ensnare us. He's trying to get his hooks in us. And we may be just thinking like a little perch that passes by and just nips at the bait. Just wants a piece of it, but doesn't want to get the whole hook in his mouth. Or we may be like a fish that's got the bait in its mouth. And it's thinking it over but it, it hasn't been hooked yet. Or we may be like a fish that's been hooked, but doesn't quite yet understand our dilemma, and we're running and stripping off line, off the reel. Or we may be like a fish that has been completely fought out and has risen to the surface, and now Satan has put his gaff in us, and he has pulled us up above the surface, out onto the deck of a boat, and we're flopping around and bleeding and fighting it, but we're dying. And all the flopping is just inflicting further injury to ourselves. That's a kind of a parallel to where this guy was. He had all of Satan's hooks in him. 
And it wasn't just invisible in his mind, his heart, his soul. It was on full display in his body. This man was so possessed that uh, he's described, in just the long description of his situation is very impressive. He is defiled by an impure spirit or an unclean spirit. So first of all, under the man possessed is this madman's defilement. Have you ever been perfectly healthy, your, your stomach not upset, and then come upon a situation, a scene, or a, 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 some stimuli, like a smell, or something that made you suddenly sick to your stomach, that just made you wretch. It's an unpleasant image. This man was that kind, he presented that kind of image. He lived not with the living, but with the dead. He lived with rotting flesh and dead men's bones. He lived in his own filth. He probably uh, had to eat things that others had thrown out. He probably was, uh, uh, you could probably smell him as far away as you could hear him. And he was crying out day and night. And in Matthew's version of this text, it says that he was exceedingly, exceedingly furious and violent and no man could pass that way. He was really, if you think about it, he was showing us sin as it truly is. Evil in its essence is not an attractive thing. It's clothed in enticement. It looks pretty on the outside. Bling, bright and shiny, but it's not what it appears to be. It's death. It is something that is sickening and destroying. And that's what this man was having to put on display. He was as offensive, not by his own choosing now, by Satan's dictate. He was as offensive as you could possibly be to normal, decent humanity. And it was a lesson in a way about what will be the end of your way if you follow Satan's way, where that road leads, where that path will take you. His destructiveness is the second point that I want you to see. Not only was he just so wretched, but he was also self-inflicting wounds. Uh, he was cutting himself. I think that the point there is that no one could restrain him. No one could chain him. They set a guard on him from time to time and he would get away from the guards and break the chains and escape into the wilderness, return to the tombs. He was a terrible example of what we do to ourselves when we become Satan's slaves. We're not just his servants, we're his slaves. And we are, uh, have you seen people that want to stop sinning and they can't stop the sinning because it has ensnared them and enslaved them, whatever form it is that they've embraced and that now has them in bondage. The self-inflicted wounds, I think, are a lesson telling us that the wages of sin are things we, we keep working on them. We keep inflicting ourselves with injury because we're so enslaved to this wrong and we can't stop it. The final thought here is not only this man's defilement and his self-destructiveness, but his desperation. If you'll look with me again, go back to Mark chapter 5. Look at verse 6. But when he saw Jesus from afar... He ran and worshiped him. He ran to Jesus. And he cried out with a loud voice, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. And then again in verses 10 and 12, 
And he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. That's the pigs, the demons uh, are going to the pigs instead. In verse 12, and all the demons begged him. They begged him saying, send us to the swine. What's going on here? This man, these demons, they knew that the end was near. These demons saw Jesus as their, their judge and their executioner. And they wanted to know if their final fate could somehow be delayed. Could they cut a bargain with God where they don't have to go back into the abyss, into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone? Can, can we just stay here and keep sinning for just a little while longer? I want to I quit, but I, like Augustine, Lord, save me, but don't save me yet. Let me stay. That's what is going on here. But they're pleading, and it shows that they're still enslaved. They're, they're not making sense because their fate is sealed. The judge has arrived, and their condemnation is sure. And so that brings us to this point of a confrontation with Jesus, point number two, the master's confrontation. He says to the demons, come out of the man, unclean spirit. Jesus would have done this in a loud voice, in a commanding tone. And then, if you read it, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of the synoptics, you get the idea that Jesus had commanded the demons to come out, and then the demons had said in response, what, what have you come to torment us for? And then Jesus responds, what is your name? And they have to respond and tell him who they are. My name is Legion, for we are many. And Jesus knows who they are. He knows their name, the way he knows our name. We can't hide our true identity from God. We can't hide our sins from God. We can delude ourselves for a while. But when we're confronted with Jesus... We can see ourselves as we truly are. And we know that we are unworthy of eternal life. We know that we, left to ourselves, will be due the punishment for our wrongs, for our sins, for our selfishness, and for our self-enslavement to Satan. The demons wanted to delay the arrival of their destiny. Lord, help me. Just help me. Later, not right now. I'm not ready. But this was their day, and they had to be punished for their wrongs. And they were cast out into the pigs, and they were cast then into the sea. But that brings us to Jesus' confrontation, not just with the demons, but with the possessed man. What was the effect of this casting out of Satan out of his life and his, uh, the fact that the bonds that other men had put on his, his evil, his wrongdoing. None of those worked. Sin would always break through and break out again. This man now suddenly has been cleansed. He's been clothed. He's been calmed and his mind has been cleared. He's sitting there. When the people from the town come out, they find him not running through the tombs not screaming and shouting, not attacking and assaulting them as he had so many times in the past. And Luke says it had been for a long time, a long time. Suddenly, this man is sitting here calmly, sitting with Jesus, and he is clothed and in his right mind. When people want to go naked for whatever reason, they're not really in their right mind. They're not reflecting the image of God. They're not uh, behaving the way that we should in, in terms of modesty and propriety. But this man was clothed. Jesus had cleansed him, and Jesus had clothed him. When you let the Lord kick Satan out of your, your house and your heart, the Lord will clothe you with his righteousness, with his his robes, uh, his white robes, 
and you will appear to God and to man as the righteous person that Jesus has made you to be. He's now in his right mind, his own mind. He's not possessed anymore, but he decides he'd like to be possessed. He willfully would like to be possessed by Jesus. And Jesus commissions this man. He um, doesn't leave him sitting there on the seashore, an empty vessel. Do you remember Matthew chapter 12, verse 43, what it says about a demon being cast out and having the house swept, and it's empty now, and it's just sitting there empty. But nothing, nature abhors a vacuum, and no heart and soul remains empty. It fills itself. We are vessels, and we get refilled. And Matthew 12 says, if you don't fill yourself with God's goodness, the demon will return and bring seven more with him that are more evil than the original, and you'll, your latter state will be far, far worse than the first. This man didn't just want to be free of Satan. He wanted to serve his Lord. He wanted to serve the one who had liber liberated him and given him freedom. And he came to Jesus and wanted to get in the boat and said, I want to be with you. I want to go with you. And he is now a man repossessed because the Lord tells him, I have something better for you. This man was so well known in this area. There would never be a greater missionary to the region to the west of the Sea of Galilee, the ten cities, Decapolis, than this man would make. And so Jesus sends this new man who's now in his right mind, he gives him a new message and he gives him a new mission. The message is, go home and tell. Go home and tell what? Go home and tell your family, your friends, your neighbors, those who knew you and knew your old life, go tell them, number one, what great things God has done for you. And the mercy, and some versions say, the compassion that God has shown to you. It's kind of a double-parted meaning, two parts. One is, it's something great that God does for us when He sets us free. It's something that men cannot do, that education or uh, medical treatment, they cannot heal the soul. They cannot set us free from our sins. But when we are free from our sins, when the Son of Man makes you free, you are free indeed. And it's, it's something great. What great things God has done for you. But it's not something to brag about. It's not something that you did. It is the compassion of Christ. It's the mercy of God poured out upon you. Go home and tell that message. Go on that mission. I heard a man preach a sermon about this text, and he called it LAMP, L-A-M-P, like a man possessed. We know what a man possessed is like when it's Satan who's doing the possessing. It's, it's the worst thing in the world because it's not of this world. But this man had a second chapter to his story. And he was now a man repossessed. And when he went and told his story, when they saw his new life, when they saw him clothed and in his right man, mind and preaching the message of Jesus of Nazareth, it says in Mark at the end of the text, in verse 20, and all marveled. They can reject your teaching. They can never reject your testimony of what God has done in you and for you. And God wants to do that for you today. I don't know where you are in your life, but if you or someone you know and love is swimming around Satan's bait, nibbling at it, you need to see where that story ends. And you need to be set free from 
your sins, your, your en enslavement to Satan and your entrapment to his snares. And the only one who can finally and fully set you free is Jesus, who can cast Satan out and cast him down and has, but who will lift you up, give you a new message for your life and a new mission for your life. And if you would come to him and obey him, put him on in baptism or return to faithful service to him and not to self and sin and Satan, would you make that need known by coming now while we stand and sing?